investment court decision is one of the reasons that people are saying let's do it this way is that we have this one court we get all these jur this jurisprudence and there's there's privacy and uh okay but one of the big arguments and one of the big problems and i certainly have it is transparency Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Discourse and Disclosure with Exterior International. With the year 2020 having come to a close, we can safely say that ECI has come a long way from being just a proof of a concept of a, what a global platform of discussion around alternative dispute resolution can be. Today, we're absolutely delighted to have with us a member of our advisory board, who has been crucial in guiding our journey to where we are today. We are joined by Arbitration Royalty, Mariam Al-Rashid, Global Co-Chair of International Arbitration and Co-Head of the Latin America Arbitration Practice Group at Evershed Sutherlands. So let me quickly rattle off a whole bunch of accomplishments. Uh, she's been recognized by Law360 as an MVP in the area of International Arbitration 2020 a future leader by Global Arbitration Review's Who's Who Legal for four years running, 2017 onwards, and a leader from this year, 2021. She's also been an adjunct professor in international investment arbitration, Fordham Law, and a guest lecturer at international arbitration at Georgetown Law School. Miriam has appeared before the ISDS, the ICJ, the PCA, London Court of International Arbitration, UN Central, the ICC, and any other thing you can really think of. And since we can't make this series endless, Ananya is going to give you a quick snapshot of Miriam's incredible body of work. Well, Miriam also works on matters surrounding post-conflict peace negotiations and governance, most notably in analyzing and documenting atrocity crimes in, against the Rohingyas in Myanmar for determination of genocide, crimes against humanity, and atrocity crimes, as well as international adjudication of atrocity crimes and mass deportation or displacement, as well as promoting transnational justice within Libya, which included drafting Libya's constitution provisions, working with Libyan attorneys and judges to train them on key transnational justice matters to support the development of platforms for new initiatives and reforms that promote transnational justice within Libya. Maryam, with this impressive, impressive line of work that you have done for now, could you please tell us how you started working in public international law and interne international arbitration, investment arbitration? Thank you very much, Ananya. Thank you, Romit. Thank you all for having me, ECI, and the listeners for having me here today. I am very privileged and honored to be here and to speak to all of you. Um, this is, if anything, the, interestingly, uh, international arbitration, international law, public international law could not be more prevalent. It wasn't before. It is even more so now, given the state of the world and in particular in the last decade. But if we look at it even in the last year, and I know some of the things we'll talk about today have a lot to do with the uh, what should happen in in um in transitioning or amending the the world of ISDS with COVID and so forth. But let me start with how I began in this world of international arbitration, public international law. Uh, and I will tell you, I started um, actually in internet, I, not international, but in litigation in Southern California. And, and I would advise anyone who wants to get into international law or international arbitration to actually work their way through litigation first. And, and there's a very simple reason for that, which I'll come to. And it's really just about honing in on certain skill sets. But I started in litigation in, in a mid-sized firm in Southern California for two years. And to be quite frank with you, I was in ter terribly, I say this to my, my former colleague there who was my boss, bored by the work because it just felt like it was sort of a cut and paste of some of the ma basic arguments. Whereas in international law, there is nothing that is the same. It is a it is different every day. There is not a, a moment that is boring, to be frank, even when you're talking about the same legal issues. Uh, so two years in, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this and into international law. Uh, 
I'm Middle Eastern. I'm half Egyptian, half Iraqi. I speak Arabic. I understand Arabic. I've traveled the world quite a bit. I lived in Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. And I felt that my legal, excuse me, my language skills and my experience uh, personally was not being utilized in the way that it needed to be in this era, in, in my professional life. So I thought, let me get into international law. It's what I've always really wanted to do, but how do I do that? And the, the fastest route seemed to be to do an LLM in international and comparative law at George Washington University. So I moved myself to GW from Southern California, GW in 2005, and started my LLM there. Now, people, listeners won't be surprised to hear that the international arbitration world, and in particular public international law as a subsect of that, is very club orientated. Um, and so if you're an, if you're a litigator, despite your skill set, which is, which if you've had enough experience, is very valuable to international law, international arbitration was not welcoming to non pure international arbitration practitioners. So as a litigator, I was perceived as an outsider. With that said, it took about three years from 2005 to 2008 for me to finish my LLM. Uh, I worked on my thesis, which had to do with um, the illegality of privatization of uh, a country's um, laws during an occupation, namely Iraq, if you'll recall, post-2003, the, the Coalition Provisional Authority had taken control over the government and over the country, and, and I was very passionate, being from Iraq, that what they were doing was not protecting under the Geneva Convention. They weren't just protecting the civilization or the civil uh, the, the civil society and the occupiers, whether they be private or belligerent, I was very passionate that what they were doing was changing the financial laws of the country, which is a violation of the Geneva Convention. So I wrote my thesis on this particular particular topic, which took me about a year and a half to do. In the in the meantime, I was teaching at George Washington um, University in international law, namely public international organizations like the United Nations and other similar organizations, and um, uh, international financial uh, law, which now I've forgotten the exact title of that class. Uh, at the same time, I was working full time at Arnold and Porter doing antitrust litigation to pay the bills, really. And while doing all of this, I was trying to get my foot in the door in the club of international arbitration. The door was shut on me numerous times for a good two years. Uh, how did I actually get in the door? Someone advised me write an article on international arbitration. And I said, How do I do this? I don't. I, how could anyone take me seriously? I'm not an international arbitration practitioner. But you'll recall in 2007, there was a case called the Desert Line case, and now I've forgotten the state entity that was the opposing side. But I wrote an article, it was the first case where moral damages were awarded against the state. Um, it's not Qatar, uh, I wanna say it's Oman, but I'm, I might be wrong, but in any event, is it Yemen? Yes, thank you. It's Yemen. That's right. Desert Line versus Yemen. Thank you. Uh, and so I was advised to write an article, a short article at Global Arbitration Review um, about the topic of moral damages and what that really means for the future of investment arbitration. I was completely out of my depths. It took me forever to write this short article that would take an otherwise you know, well-practitioned uh, arbitrator to write, uh, but I did it. And that's one baby step in the direction of international arbitration. While teaching at George Washington in international law, I was able to sort of build my CV that way. And then I eventually, after a significant amount of networking and time in Washington, D.C., got my foot in the door at Crow and Mooring, where they gave me an opportunity to work in the International Arbitration Group, which had just started in early 2008. So I was coming in as part of like a four or five team group of people. And um, that's how I got my start in international arbitration, was just at Kroll and Mooring right from uh, that get-go. But I had to take to that initial step for, of writing this article putting together really, your frankly, and lived experiences uh, I, I, was, was and getting out of my depth. But you got to do that. You got to start somewhere you don't that's know really and, and work and I your wish way out. we could talk.
more about your thesis for the podcast, <laughs> but I've, I've got to dive into the next question. So in, in this podcast in the past, we've discussed the history of ISDS claims and how they've worked out. But the way it works today uh, in, in modern times is the BIT or bilateral investment treaties. Could you tell us a little about how BITs have evolved with the times and what are some of the differences we see today? For example, a lot of BITs now have a standing roster of arbitrators, something which used to be more ad hoc when a claim was invoked. And otherwise, even say in the new NAFTA treaty, you now have guidance notes written into the BIT itself that direct you with how certain provisions are to be interpreted. Do you think these changes are to stay? Are they for the better or worse? I'd love to hear your point of view. Very good question, uh, a complex one. So what what we're seeing from bilateral investment treaties nowadays, well, there, there's a lot of controversy, right, about revision and, and changes to ISDS and in particular, uh, how can we prevent countries from regulating their, their their right to regulate, right? The right to regulate certain sectors, particularly when it relates to environmental issues, for example. Um, I, I should say South America is a very good example of that, where you'll see treaties involving South American countries have certain provisions that are very specific to um, to environmental issues. Uh, now, it, it's hard. It's hard to talk about what's changing with BITs without first kind of acknowledging how the European Union specifically is taking their direction to to BITs. We all know that in I think it must have been in 2018 the ACMEA decision came out out of the European um, uh, Commission's. Uh, uh, I guess a query or a request for for a decision from from the court there, and no one, even even EU countries, and I say this because a case that I have uh, I've mentioned before to to both of you against the state of Poland, even the state of Poland did not expect, as many EU countries did not expect the ACMEA decision to come out the way that it did, but it did because. What what I think is really happening with bilateral investment treaties is countries are finding that it's becoming far too easy. I don't think it is. They're finding it that it's far too easy for foreign investors to bring claims against countries for decisions that countries are making that are regulatory in form and what they call for the benefit of their own citizens, for the benefit of their own civilians, for the benefit of their own sectors and economies. And what's frustrating about this position that I feel that states are taking, whether it be South America, the European Union states, or anywhere else around the world, is that embedded in, and yes, there are treaties that have been revised, but embedded within treaties is the right to do that. I mean, you take expropriation as one perfect example. You have a right to expropriate an asset. You just have to pay fair market value. It's very, it's, it's that simple. If you have a reason to revoke a concession that, let's say I'm using concession as one example, as a state, you have a reason to revoke a concession by a foreign investor, then it has to be a reasoned decision. It can't be arbitrary. It can't be discriminatory to national investors. That is the very reason that these states have signed these treaties, so they can bring investments, foreign investments into their countries and grow their economies. It's the simple rule of life. You cannot gain something by being restricted by something else. There's no no pain, no gain, if you want to put it in that very sort of pedantry term. But the truth is, if you want foreign investment and growth and economy, you have to then give up some free will. Now, that free will does not mean that states that sign on to treaties uh, are not allowed to regulate their economies, are not allowed to re regulate foreign investment, are not allowed to change the regulatory reform, right? Um, it just means that there is a repercussion to that change. And even if there's a change to regulatory reform, and let's say as many investors, because this is something you're seeing a lot in, in, in disputes, for those that are not necessarily practitioners, I can tell you as a practitioner, I see this a lot as an argument by states. I was just in trial against Egypt. And one of the main arguments was, <clears throat> this is public, it's an ex-dispute. One of the main arguments was, 
we are free to change our regulation with respect to uh, this is this will make you laugh sewerage system i mean we're talking about the most basic of, for the new cairo project a sewerage system okay this is very much a health and safety issue it's a civil society issue it's how do you build a city how do you build a population that is safe and clean and and so on and so forth and the response or or the argument that egypt makes is this is regulation that a state has a right to be very strict about, and you cannot prevent us from amending our regulations uh, to accommodate for what might be uh, environmental changes within the country, population changes within country. You, you, can, you can go down the list of, of reasons why they might say. Our response is, no, of course, you, we wouldn't even dream of suggesting you do that. We're not trying to take from your sovereignty as a state. What we're saying is when you change this regulation and what many investors say is when you change this regulation, you must do it in a way that is not arbitrary. It is not discriminatory. And if you do it even in that manner, at the very least, you must pay fair market value. That's what the whole expropriatory clause in many of these investment arbitration, uh, excuse me, bilateral investment treaties are, are uh, state. So to your question, Romain, is how are they changing? I think a lot of, I think a lot of treaties, and I, I have not done a, a, a study of treaties. I, I, I would love to one day or maybe read something on this, but I've not done it. I think a lot of treaties are going to start carving out the expropriation provision. And the reason for that is because they're, go they're going to want to say that we can expropriate if we can justify the reasons and that they're not arbitrary and they're not discriminatory, but we also don't have to pay far mar fair market value. As long as we're doing it in a way that is for the benefit of our economy, for the benefit of our people, you can't stop us and you can't make us pay hundreds of millions because it's a sticker shock value that we see a lot of countries react to and tribunals. They don't like the numbers that claimant investors throw out, right? For damages. We're going to see a lot of these treaties change over the course of time to take out the expropriation provision. And you see that even now. I mean, um, I won't say specifically with, with regard to this case against Poland what the particular arguments are, but the expropriation provision is one of them where they say you, you, you can't um, uh, the expropriation provision doesn't particularly apply here, and in fact, they might even argue that one doesn't exist. But then you might have a most favored nation provision where you have to look to other treaties that this particular state has signed on to, and they haven't amended those, and there's an expropriation provision in those. And so then you apply it to this particular case. So it's just not simple enough to start amending the treaties because you'd have to literally do what the EU has done, which is eliminate the treaties altogether and say going forward these don't apply that's fine going forward these don't apply but retroactivity is where we obviously see a lot of the the, the issues arise in in the acme and intra eu uh, treaty uh, situation that we're facing but uh, that's where i think the treaties are going to change is i think the expropriation provisions are going to be carved out most certainly i think you really hit the nail on the head there with mentioning evolution of treaties and carving up because of the sovereignty question. And of course, the EU is nothing if not ambitious. So in the UN Central Working Group mm -hmm. Treaty mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they talk about the possibility of developing a single multilateral investment court for the globe. <laughs> what do you think of this? Is this a realistic prospect? What are the kind of challenges that you think may take place because of this? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, so, so, so what's, first of all, I'm not, a, I'm not in favor of multilateral uh, investment court um, because what that does is it takes away from the very independence of, it, it's almost, this is, I, I'm going to be very sort of uh, pedestrian about this, uh, and I kind of have to be because I have to be careful about what I say here. Some of these arguments are going to be things that I'm debating within um, within certain working groups and also in, in a trial yet to come. But there's a big elephant in the room here, which is that 
what you're having is you're simplifying what is already, you're trying to simplify a very complex system. The world is complex. Countries are very complex. They are unique by nature. To call, to make the argument that we're sovereign and we, um, and we hold our own independent concerns about our civil society and our economies. And then to tie that into this notion of multilateral investment courts would be to me just a contradiction in and of itself. The beauty of ISDS, ISDS, regardless of all of its quirks, which I think there are many quirks, but they don't have to do, for me, they're not about the system itself. It's more about the practice within the system. Um, is to basically create a system like the Supreme Court Justice, the Supreme Court of the United States. And one of the things we love about international law is that you don't have, it's not like a common law jurisdiction where you have uh, binding decisions. You have jurisprudence, they are informative, and sometimes they are maybe, even though tribunals may not like to say this, they're, they're not binding, but they're very sort of influential to tribunals going forward, but they're not binding. And I feel that a multilateral investment court would absolutely reach a level of the things like the Supreme Court of the United States, where all of a sudden you have a similar common law jurisdiction situation where a decision prior, two months prior, um, it has now had a binding effect of sorts, even ad hoc in a way, binding effect on a decision coming later. And in a world, you cannot apply that because Libya is different from Poland. Uh, Egypt is different from the United States. Mexico is different from Canada. Even if you have relationships, treaty relationships between these countries, you can't have a multilateral investment court that's going to be able to actually apply the same reasoning and thinking across the board. And I just think it's going to lead to that even if the intention will not be for it to be binding, it will absolutely have binding in effect. Just like the ICJ, which doesn't have binding effect, it has, you know, you, have, you get ICJ opinions, right? And they ha they're called opinions and they have influential or their opinions are influenced upon, the decisions have influence upon whatever might arise from whatever the the particular concern. I have something going to the ICJ now that has to do with uh, border disputes, and I can't speak about it, but it's with the um, with the uh, with a current ongoing war right now in Eastern Europe between two countries. Those decisions should have should have opinion, and they should have effect. They should have in, they should be informative, but they should not have binding effect. But the ICJ that puts out an opinion naturally causes other tribunals to look at it and say, well, it's the ICJ. And they're automatically going to feel this sort of emphasis and pressure to apply the reasoning that the ICJ comes out with. I think the same thing could happen with a multilateral investment court. And we can go on and on about these kind of systems or this kind of issue. Um, but again, I'm a little bit restricted on it. So yes, I think Ananya wanted to, to ask a question. So I'm going to take a step back here and understand what exactly this multi multilateral uh, court system is, which the UNISATRA working group is suggesting. So from what I understand, it's something similar to how we have the permanent court of arbitration. So basically one court wherein um, this one court will adjudicate upon all ISDS disputes across the world. So now that brings me to two questions. One, isn't it true that um, a lot of cases, ICS cases, which come to arbitration are confidential? So the award isn't all out to the public, rather a, a part of it is kept confidential given that these are, well, one of the beauties about arbitration is that a lot of things can happen. So the question is that um, since a lot of these cases, a lot of these ISDS cases which come to arbitration aren't naturally public and they are kept confidential. At least certain parts of the award are kept confidential. How do we use these as precedent going forward? So say, for example, if we do make a structure wherein all ISDS cases are referred to this particular court, something like the ICJ, um, how do we still use precedent given that their previous decisions won't be public? They'll still be confidential. 
Uh, because the same way that today they're they're confidential and you can still find jurisprudence, you'll find awards as long as the parties allow for those decisions to be uh, published uh, all the time. Right now we had an award uh, come to us and, and the question to the parties was, will you allow this to be published? And it's a decision to make. So the same decision can be brought to uh, to the parties in that situation and allow then for awards to become jurisprudence. So it's the same, the same thing would apply in that sense. If, if they, if they kept it completely, th this is what bothers me about, this is one of the issues. And again, I, I get into disputes with, the, with working groups on this. It's one of the things that bothers me about the multilateral investment court decision is one of the reasons that people are saying, let's do it this way is that we have this one court, we get all these ju this jurisprudence and there's, there's privacy and, uh, Okay, but one of the big arguments and one of the big problems, and I certainly have it, is transparency. So how do you have transparency when you're going to keep the decisions even more so uh, privatized? And the 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 question is, do how will they become public? Well, I think they can because there has to be a right for the parties to decide if they want the publication or not. It cannot be something imposed where no decisions are made public. There has to be an opportunity for those to be to be public. But in part of these things, let me just, let me, there's, there's a number of, of, of ways in which the multilateral court uh, suggestion is, is saying, the suggestion, what they're suggesting it's going to address, right? So they're saying a multilateral approach will terminate investment treaties uh, and or withdraw consent to ISDS procedures, just like we've seen the EU uh, attempt to do now, which which is not working in their favor in the retroactive sense, but it will do obviously uh, going forward. And then it says, uh, one of the other things that we've discussed is that it allow states to bring counterclaims, which is a unique thing that we don't see today. And this is something that states are saying is very important. And I do agree on this sense on one level, is that a lot of the claimant investors, and God help me, I think my colleagues might slap me in the face for saying this, um, claimant investors will go to states and they'll go make an investment in something that involves mining, oil, gas concession, uh, anything in mineral resource uh, ex exploration and exploitation, and it'll impact the environment. And then the investor gets kicked out for one reason or another that might not have anything to do with any of those issues, but they're certainly prevalent and, and, and important. And the state has no, no ability to state. They might do, they might come in, and you might have NGOs come and do non-disputing um, party interventions, environmental, uh, uh, right, uh, amicus curiae uh, pr proceedings and put those papers in to explain the environmental concerns and how this impacts civil society. But the truth is a state does have a right to say, well, we have a counterclaim to this. You've impacted our, our, our uh, environment in X, Y, Z ways. But they also have to then address the human rights issue. They have to address it. Environmental rights or human rights. They have to address that human rights are part of investment arbitration in ISDS and in, in public international law, and it, it plays a part. And you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you're going to make those arguments and want counterclaims to say, you investor have impacted our country in a negative way. We did not anticipate that, or we did not understand it, or it became new information later, and we want you out, then you have to also accept that human rights is part of this this system so it will allow counterclaims by 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 states and i agree that i agree with that i think that's a fair thing if you were to take this approach of multilateral investment disputes and i'm actually for it even if you didn't take the multilateral investment court situation um, it would also, again, as I've, I've mentioned, it protects the state's rights and duty to regulate the public interest by dismissing claims against legitimate non-discriminatory and lawful decisions to protect the public interest. Important, not against that, but guess what? That's already part and parcel of ISDS arguments that states make today. So you don't need a multilateral investment treat, uh, uh, court to allow states to do that. They can do that. Frankly, just like they can when they make argument, arguments about environmental or human rights concerns, it's just that they can't make counterclaims in, in the current ISDS system. And without going you know, into too much detail, um, it, would, uh, it would require 
this is what bothers me the most, I think, of all of the things. It would require investors to exhaust all local remedies before challenging a state before the ISDS tribunals. Give me a break. I mean, if you had to go to the countries, most of the countries that are getting sued in the international investment arbitration world, I as a lawyer will tell my clients who are claimant investors, and I've represented states, sovereign states, but claimant investors mostly, I'll tell them, if you don't have to do this, don't do this because it is a painful, exhausting exercise. You never want to do an investment arbitration again. As an investor, if you've done it once, you don't want to do it again. So if you're coming to that point, you've tried, and most of our investors have tried in administrative courts, for example, to, to find remedies of some form. Usually they're not damages remedies because they're administrative courts, right? So they're more injunctive of kind or they're trying to, you know, create um, action uh, to change regulation. But to say exhaust local remedies is merely a waste of resources and time because we know that the local systems are very uh, partial to their own country. So they're naturally not going to rule in favor most of the time for the foreign investors. So that's one of the things of this multilateral investment uh, court that that they're, they're saying would be, would be um, addressed by this court, which to me, again, it doesn't fix an already existing problem and it only compounds it and it doesn't solve the issues, which is injustice to foreign investors. I think those are some really valuable inputs. And I, I think this is also the first point of disagreement that I would have where I, I do see a lot of value in exhausting local remedies before approaching anything else, but also when you speak about the EU and their, their approach to the system, I see you putting up a strong defense to the charge they lay of fragmentation within the system, and I appreciate that point. I think that's a good point to make and should be considered. Now, with that, just before we touch upon the human rights questions th that you've spoken of, I want to go back to the idea of arbitration being sort of an exclusive club, per se, and Looking at the strong background and issues of public international law that investment disputes deal with, do you th what do you think of what's increasingly a common practice of international commercial arbitrators sitting in as the panel in an ISDS claim instead of individuals with more specific expertise? Mm -hmm. Has this affected the nature of the awards that are coming out in a positive way or what are the kind of changes you would like to see within this current setup? That is such a good question. Um, and I'm going to have to add a little side note to your question because the setup is more problematic, if I'm being frank, for the recycling of the same people sitting on tribunals than it is about whether such persons or people were or are commercial arbitration specialists versus ISDS specialists. Um, but let me start with the way that you've sort of, you've, you've posed it. I do think that there is indeed an issue. Uh, the, the gravity of it is, is a separate question. An issue with non specialized investment arbitration specialists sitting on investment arbitration tribunals. And the problem or the issue is there are very complex ISDS issues that arise in investment arbitrations, um, sometimes so complex that you, even as the practitioner, that you are entrenched in your own case, you're still, it's a whirlwind, right? I mean, you need a whole army of people to get through a case. So commercial arbitration specialists that are, and this is, fair and unfair in a way, but let me try to put it into sort of buckets. They are confined by, uh, let's put the seat of the arbitration aside, right? They're confined by the governing law of the contract and the four corners of the contract. The four corners of the contract means you have to interpret whatever that particular contract is in commercial arbitration, whatever the transaction is between the disputing parties. And then within uh, interpretation of that contract, the four corners of that, you're using the governing law that's been identified. The seat of the arbitration can create some dilemmas, but you're going to have the seat of the arbitration dilemmas, whether you're an investment arbitration or commercial arbitration. So that you, you can really just toss to the side. 
So there, I'm not going to call it simplicity, but there is a more fluid way of dealing with commercial arbitration as an arbitrator, a less, <clears throat> a less confounding uh, state of affairs as you sit there and try to reason a decision and come out with a conclusion on on a dispute before you. Whereas in investment arbitration, if you are not specialized in investment arbitration, you, you'll face a multitude of other issues that investment arbitration specialists are more uh, aware of, more inclined to think of as they sit on these tribunals time and time again, or they dispute them as arbitrator counsel. Um, and those have to do with political issues. I mean, things like corruption in the making of the investment, which is, I, I, I have such an issue with that because uh, Jan Paulson and I was sort of, sort of head to head on this issue because you, you can't say an investor has, has um, created the investment in a corrupt manner uh, and then and then call the state completely benign and 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 having done no wrong if the investor has engaged in, in the investment in a corrupt manner it means that it did so with the engagement of the state unless right unless the state purportedly when in making the investment there was a representative that was not you could not attribute that representative of the state to the actual sovereign state which is again a very complex issue these are things that commercial arbitration specialists are not going to be as wise to or akin to or or thoughtful of so you you do face those dilemmas now but you're you're rarely going to see in an investment arbitration panel a group of all commercial arbitration specialists sitting there uh, with no investment arbitration expert expertise. So you might have the benefit, in fact, where a commercial arbitration specialist may say, okay, I think you're going way too much into the trenches on XYZ issue. Let's just focus in on the joint venture between the state entity or the state and and the investor. Let's there's a, there might be good mixing and matching if you have a commercial arbitration specialist on on the panel. So I'm not going to say that that it's a problem as such, but uh, no, you don't want three commercial arbitration specialists sitting before a very complex intra-EU bilateral investment treaty dispute, for example. That's problematic, right? But again, side note, the real problem in 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 this sort of dynamic here in investment arbitration is we have a recycling of of arbitrators sitting at panels who already have taken very strong positions in regards to state issues or investor issues. And that seems to me to be more of the problem than it is about the expertise, if I'm being frank. I'm gonna follow up on that and at the same time play a little bit of uh, devil's advocate here. Um, so the main problem that we could gauge from having um, these arbitration panels is not that they don't have the expertise, but rather the, the same arbitrators sitting on multiple cases. Do you think having a multilateral court system would just add to the problem, given that there will be one, say, panel of arbitrators which is chosen for this particular court? And then all of these ISDS disputes will be referred to these courts. So it'd be very difficult for arbitrators to differ from their earlier position. 100%. It will be, the problems we face today when it comes to this issue will be compounded times 10. And it's really scary to me to think that. And it means that, and again, I don't want to make it akin to, because no one suggested that you're going to have a panel that stays in place for the lifetime, like you have the Supreme Court in the US, which I think is really problematic to have someone sit on the lifetime. You know, I, that's just crazy to me, but it is the system. Uh, so it's not that, but yeah, I think you're going to see the same problem and worse if you had this multilateral investment court. Since we're on the topic of having, um, well, not having too much of a diversity in the panel of arbitrators, Miriam being um, a very accomplished woman, and that too, somebody who's not typically from um, these white Western countries, do you feel that there is a lack of diversity in the field? Or do you see there being a shift in having more women arbitrators on the panel, or women of color on the panel? <laughs> oh my gosh. There is no lack of diversity in culture today. Um, well, maybe that's not fair for me. Maybe I'm being a little bit uh, extreme. Yes, you still have the old white male, and I say this openly, the old white man sitting on the panel 
good Lord, I've seen your face a thousand times. I know exactly how you're going to come out on this issue. It's ridiculous. So maybe, yes, that's not fair for me to say there's no lack of diversity in culture or, or language or uh, ethnicity. There is. There's still that problem. We still have the ma old white man from a Western world, usually England, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And it's ridiculous. And it, and it needs to stop. But the biggest problem is the female uh, male ratio. And I love how, and I would go head to head with Susan Frank on this. Um, I forget where she teaches now at, uh, Susan Frank teaches at uh, American University still, and I think somewhere else. And she, she, she and I have been, sat on panels and talked about this, and, and she has a sort of statistical analysis. But the statistical analysis is already swayed and, and wrong because we're going by a set of maybe 15, maybe less female arbitrators that you could name. I mean, you, you could already think of who they are, and they're wonderful. I have no problem with these. It, Brigitte Stern I have a huge problem with. I'd say it to her face if I saw her tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Um, she state sided she's state biased and that's a problem for me right and she continues to be represent uh, appointed by state sovereigns that is an issue um, most other female arbitrators that are continually appointed i think are phenomenal and they have they have they're sort of the the trailblazers for us but they are repeatedly repeatedly appointed over and over and over again so we have both the white male problem at the top old white male problem from western countries at the top we have a, it, we're not as, it, it, that's not the biggest problem because we see a lot of men of diverse ethnicity and race, races on, on, on panels as well. So that's okay. Then we have the female issue, but they're from a very small select number. So that's a real problem. And there's an age issue. And the age issue is a huge issue. People should not undermine. Younger generation international uh, arbitration specialists or younger generation disputes lawyers that we're talking from the ages of 30, early 30s that have had at least five years experience to whatever, 55, 60, are just as critical to the panel being fair and equitable and right and thoughtful as it is to have someone of unique race or different race and gender. So you might have female arbitrators sitting on these panels and yes, they're from a very small number of female, you know, uh, group of female arbitrators that continue to get appointed. But the other problem is that they're also older. So what's happening with our, you know, 30 to 35 year olds who have a view of the world that I'm sorry to say, older arbitrators just simply don't see it the same way. And it's not its not right. You have to have diversity. That's part of why international law is so unique. You need uniqueness to provide unique decisions and think in a unique manner and come out with analyzed and, and proper analyzed decisions. So it, it's a huge issue. And as a female arbitrator, I can tell you, um, I have been appointed and they've been investment arbitrations on which I've been appointed. Um, and they've mainly been for one, the Islamic Cooperation of, of uh, Councils, so the APPGI. Um, and uh, I'm not often appointed because of my age, although I think people don't realize I'm a little older than I am. But also, I'm not appointed because I'm opinionated about the fact that I have issues with certain ways in which panels are, are driven. Uh, and that's, that poses a problem for, for parties and, and other arbitrators. If, if I try and summarize that very quickly, you've pointed out the issues with having panels that are, in fact, in fact pale, male, and stale. <laughs> Otherwise, we can see that we have very, very accomplished women being put on panels, but it's, it's just this token gesture with the same people being repeated again and again. And I'm just flagging this for our listeners out there. But if you are interested in the age issue, there's, there's an interest, a Parisian interest group called Paris Baby Arbitration that kind of talks about this. And you should check their website out and they have a little journal. It's quite nice. But with that, uh, I, I'd really like to ask you a little more detail about the relationship between human rights and ISDS claims. In particular, perhaps, if you would like to comment on the early Argentinian cases from the 2000s, and do they really set the right kind of precedent with the application of the FPSS standard, so full protection and security in the way that they've dealt with it? 
So I'll talk about the human rights uh, issues. I don't think that I can competently comment on the Argentinian ones, if I'm being very frank, because I wouldn't have studied them in their early 2000s. So, I mean, I could try, but I, w I would do myself a disservice and your, and your listeners a disservice. But I am going to talk about uh, the human rights issue here. Um, so a lot of people look at this as human rights and environmental obligations, right? They don't just make it human rights and not bring in the environmental obligations issue. It's, it tends to be one and the same in what they call the new generation investment treaties. So you have that and then at new generation investment treaties and then you have what they call and i did write this down because i was researching this the other day for one of my treaties my my cases human rights and environmental issues in international arbitration generally so let's just start with that one first and then we can we can get into new generation if we want to but the Argentinia, Argentinian issue is raised in the general concept of human rights issues in international arbitration and they're arising more and more, and most notably where we see that states are invoking, um, uh, uh, host states are invoking uh, as a shield, as I've mentioned earlier today, as we talked about, to a defense, right, brought by a claim by an investor. Um, an example, uh, this is public. I, I represented um, claimants in a mining dispute against Colombia. Um, we were, as the investors, the ones engaging in all of the environmental factors, all bringing in environmental specialists to make sure that we were enhancing Medellin, the area where a lot of the mining was happening in Colombia. And Colombia was, in fact, the reasons the claim was brought, one of, one of the things they were failing to do in full protection security, failing in their FPS standards under the relevant uh, treaty, was and this was the Canadian Columbia Treaty, was stopping rogue miners, which were just regular people living in Medellin by these by these mines who needed to make a living. But in the way that they were going in and mining the gold, they were causing environmental problems that would, you know, if you have a mine at the top of a hill and the way that they'd mine, you'd a lot of the 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 problems from the mine, a lot of the environmental issues would go stream downwards, okay, if I'm putting it in pedantic terms, so or, or, or pedestrian terms. So we were actually the ones helping the environment, but the state of Colombia immediately did sort of this trigger knee-jerk effect of invoking this shield. We must defend the reason we want you out and the reason we're not going to invoke this FPS stand, we're not going to abide or we're not going to claim or admit that we failed in our FPS is that in fact, we feel you have damaged our environment, okay? And that's a human rights issue. And they've brought in NGOs and other organizations to claim why gold mining generally in the country is problematic to human rights and is problematic in this case. So that was a general international arbitration issue, human rights and environmental issues in international arbitration. And there's also this emerging, um, this emerging concept of international human rights and environmental issues as a basis for counterclaims by host states, which host states are starting to think about counterclaims against foreign investors, with a prominent example being from, and again, I won't speak in detail because I, I don't think I'm educated enough on the topic, but I remember Urbacer versus Argentina was one of those cases where you first saw that counterclaim come up on the issues of environmental uh, human rights issues. And it was a first investment arbitration in which we saw Right, and, and if you if you just study straight international human rights and international arbitration, or human rights and international arbitration, it was the first international arbitration in which we saw that there were tribunals accepting jurisdiction over a human rights counterclaim. Again, counterclaim on that, but it's not really a counterclaim; it's just a defense. But they weren't so, right, but they called it a counterclaim. Okay, um, beer. Uh, Bear uh, Creek, is another example versus, of one of those claims that brings uh, these in. Not Ecuador, Peru. And there, they found that the mining project was, in fact, expropriated by the state. Um, and the action, the state action it, it revoked the license on, to a foreign investor there, Bear Creek, um, on the basis that it 
but it penalized, I should tell you, it penalized the investor in the damages phase, okay? Because they said that you failed to obtain a social license to operate. And this is the, this is the uniqueness about South America. When you do these investments for, for concessions and mining or anything that will impact the environment, you have to take a poll of the civil society in which you're impacting, right? So if you're doing mining, uh, if you're doing a water project, you have to take a poll. So that was a similar thing in Peru there where they had a social uh, a social license to operate. It, to do that social license to operate, it's like a de facto consent of the population, the surrounding population about where you're going to function. And you have to go and you have to poll and you have to talk. And it's, it, you, it's like a round table or a, 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 what do they call it? Um, city hall event and you have to get basically the consent of the population. And then that consent goes to administrative courts and you get a social license. So you see these human rights, environmental issues way back when, as you mentioned, Romit, in early 2000s, from starting from Argentina, one of those cases, now they're just becoming more and more prevalent because the, the, uh, the ECT, is one of the biggest uh, treaties, uh, multilateral investment treaties that people are looking to to say there's a very, the, the word environment, you know, th there's a point energy equals environment. It's all in the treaty itself. Um, the Dutch model bilateral investment treaty in 2008, the Dutch, mo the Dutch government announced that it was, going to, it was going to renegotiate its bilateral investment treaties with non-European nations based on a new model that would pr provide protections offered to foreign investors and reflect a sustainable investment policy, right? So this is the new generation we're seeing. Because right now, investors are aware that they have to, they have to, act as it's a corporate responsibility issue. It's a sustainable responsibility human rights issue. And you'll see it in all these industrial type clients like Talis and um, the big industrial companies, Adita Birla, which functions a lot in India, for example, Birla Carbon. They have to provide sustainability standards. So these countries that know certain companies are going to invest in them, especially industrial type entities, they're going to sign on to these new treaties, accepting that they have to accept certain environmental sustainable investment policies. Otherwise, they're going to kick, get kicked out. And everyone wants to care about the world today with climate change. So there's going to be a new generation of investment treaties that are absolutely going to speak explicitly, not in a sort of implied sense, explicitly to human rights and environmental issues. I think that's incredibly enlightening. And just as we reach the end of our podcast, I'd like to quickly ask you about, I would suppose, what has been the most impactful experiences you've had working in post-conflict negotiation scenarios. And, and just could you tell us more about just how differently that works versus, say, pre-existing conflicts or an investor state dispute? What are the, how do you operate with such different power dynamics? And what are the real possibilities of change that you see working in an area such as that? So th thank you. If, if, it's also a reminder because when I, I think asked about how I got into investment arbitration in public international, I didn't touch upon the public international law component. I should say I went into international arbitration wanting to do public international law. And by that, I mean more of the sort of post-conflict dispute resolution issues or post-conflict negotiations, uh, human rights, genocide, uh, crimes against humanity. All of that to me was not separate from international law. It just happens to be international arbitration was sort of the bread and butter of, of making a career. What I would like to tell listeners, whether they be practitioners or students or both, it, anyone who tells you to limit yourself to one thing, tell them to just go find a wall and run a thousand miles to it, okay? Because I was told a thousand times, oh, you're doing litigation, you can't do arbitration. I told them, no, I will, and I did. I am doing international arbitration. People thought, okay, well, that's a lot, you know, but that's not really public international law. Well, I understand it's not post-conflict resolution, it's not constitutional reform, it's not regulatory reform. I get that. But nothing stops me from being able to look into those areas and ask to help. All you got to do is get your foot in the door. So I 
to be very frank, the how I got into, and I'll tell you the interesting parts of it and what's been most challenging, what's been most interesting, how I got into it was was in 2000 and I want to say 14, I think it was with Afghanistan, when they needed to amend their commercial arbitration law to accommodate for arbitration. And then we had to go to Istanbul, Turkey, me and a delegation and teach the parliament, which actually surprisingly was majority female at the time, right? And everyone thought that would not be the case. Majority female of the parliament came, sat, learned about arbitration, learned about what the trial model rules were and so on. Um, and then we taught more of the lawyers and the and the judges about details into how what does enforcement really mean as a judge when a, an arbitration comes to you. So that's how I really got into it. Then I became more involved in pro bono work with the Public International Law Policy Group, P PILPG, and uh, the Vance Center for International Justice, on which I sit as a committee uh, board member, where. I became more involved in this post-conflict uh, resolution work. PILPG offered opportunities with regard to Libya and Iraq because those were in you know, 2010, 2011, especially 2012, 2013, post-Arab Spring, it, it, Libya in particular being one of the key issues, you saw this, this question of, well, now what do you do with a, new, with a country that has no real leader? Um, doesn't have a real uh, defined government, and in fact, two country or two capitals or two state uh, cities saying that they're the capitals or they're the government, Benghazi, Tripoli. What do you do now with constitutional reform? How do you prosecute the non-state actors that have come to the country from Syria, from Senegal, for I can't t from Iraq, and have? Uh, fought on the ground, either fought against what they believe to be ISIS, or fought against the government of Libya, or fought against NATO members who happened to be on the ground at the time. The question was non-state actors, what do you do with them? How do you now negotiate with non-state actors? Um, and then when you can decide they're not people you can negotiate with because they're not a defined entity, how do you prosecute? So these were all things that no one knew how do uh, we didn't know how to do it so we just went through literally I, I will not i kid you not this is the biggest challenge on the libya prosecution front and non-state actors what do you do there we went through i want to say 27 different jurisdictions of the world from europe to east asia to central asia and looked into their history and into their legal uh their their um cr criminal legal structure even though it did not, it, you, you, they're not, you're not oranges to oranges or apples to apples, you're comparing. But we looked at various historical events dating way back to World War I and World War II and looked at how there were prosecutions from that point on and what would be a violation of due process. How could you prosecute a non-state actor in absentia who's not a citizen of Libya but is a citizen of Syria and went back there or is living in Iraq now? So those were very big challenges that no one knew and PILPG asked us to help because they didn't, these are new things. We had to figure it out. They didn't, we realized they weren't entirely new because we went back to history to figure it out, but it's not something that it's on the top of everyone's mind. So we were able to figure that out. And the one thing that I will say last and I'll, I'll stop there is the Rohingya genocide issue was the most, to me, um, rewarding analysis that we've done when it came to issues of post-conflict, and it's not post-conflict resolution, it's post-conflict or, or continued conflict uh, prosecution, um, because this was a genocide, but people were questioning whether it was, whether mass deportation of a people and then the rape and pillaging and killing of this mass deportation of a people of a certain uh, religion could qualify as a genocide. And it became baffling to me that you could even ask that question, but you had to find the law to explain that it was. And once we did that, we were able right now, you see, I think it's Gambia that's brought the matter at the ICJ, right? And they, Foley Hoag, is using our, our memo that analyzes how you can qualify this as a genocide and it violates various conventions. They're using that memo. So that's been the most rewarding thing when it comes to post-conflict or current conflict issues.
Just a very quick follow up on that, Miriam. Um, how impactful do you think the International Court of Justice, sorry, the International uh, Criminal Court has been, um, say, on the Rohingya dispute, or in general, given the, um, well, given how different criminal, international criminal cases are vis a vis civil cases or investment cases? Yeah, um, not very impactful, not as impactful as it should be. Um, right now, they're considering, I've been for, for a long time, and just this morning, I was talking to a practitioner in Europe about <clears throat> about the Israel-Palestine issue, um, a longstanding issue that the ICC till today has not uh, has not addressed, but they are investigating finally, right? So you have the tribunal investigative, it's behind the scenes, the, I forget, it's PT, it stands, the, pre -trial chamber. Yeah, thank PTC. you, the pretrial chambers, thank you, the PTC, uh, PTC is doing the investigative analysis right now, and, and again, they're just too slow, um, they've done some great work. Let's not let's not lie and say they haven't. They've gone there's special tribunals in place. They've they've they have indicted and prosecuted um, individuals uh, for particular actions. But you know the ICC should have had a more handle on taking rogue states or rogue actors, particular states. And I'm not going to name presidents of particular states and take a view on it. But in I'll, I'll name one. Saddam Hussein being indicted in his own country was just a sham prosecution. Now, whether you believe he should or shouldn't have been prosecuted is not my point. My point is if you were going to prosecute such an individual for crimes against humanity, you don't prosecute them in the state that 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 just brought him down. You prosecute him in it, what is meant to be a, a neutral forum. And the ICC should have had more of a handle on something on that. Uh, but of course, they, they, they can't because there's the politics of the United States, the Coalition Provisional Authority, the, the, the United Kingdom, um, and France, all of the members of the Security Council who would never have uh, wanted to see anything but prosecution of such an individual in that country. So I would like to see the ICC get far more active. And they remember, they made a, they made a, the, the PTC, was it the PTC? You might know this, Ananya, better than I do, because this was about three years ago, and I recall being infuriated when the UK or US and UK, US and UK, but I want to say maybe US forces were being investigated for crimes in Afghanistan. And the ICC, right. right, they came out and they ultimately decided that they could not take it to the next stage of investigative review. That, have you read that decision? Yes, I, I've read a brief of it. Yes, I'm, I'm it, just slipping my mind the name is. But it, uh, it, was a, it was a while ago because it was about three years ago. That was, that was why the Vance Center actually put me on the board because I had a call at the Vance Center and I said, that someone needs, this is a load of crap. I don't know what happened here. This is unreal that I, it was not even a reasoned decision in my mind. And it was something like 28 pages. It was something small and short and ridiculous. So when I look at that, I say the ICC has a long road ahead of it. Has it accomplished a lot? Yes, but can it do more? Absolutely, 100%. And, the, and, and I don't care if we have to do something about the Rome statute because the United States is one of the biggest uh, violators of human rights around the world. And it is not a signatory to the Rome statute and thus the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction. Well, let's get around that because that's ridiculous that you can just decide you're going to exclude yourself from something so you can continue to commit crimes. That's ridiculous. That's not how the world should function. So I'd like to see the ICC be revised more so than ISDS system, if you asked me. That, that was very enlightening. And I think um, it's kind of bringing us towards the end, wherein we ask you for advice, Miriam, as law students and also young practitioners who are trying to make a name in this field. What would be, say, I mean, it would be very naive for me to say, give us five tips and we'd work with them, um, given how, uh, how many experiences you shared with us and how different experiences have taught you different things. And of course, that has come through in, through this entire podcast. But what would be your advice to young law students and practitioners who are trying to make a name in this field, who are trying to get their, step, their foot in the door? It, one, um, do not at all put weight upon people's praise 
of you nor their criticism of you. Because if you put weight upon people's praise, then you're automatically going to fall when they criticize. If you put weight on their criticism, then you're going to shrink uh, and not be able to rise above that moment because there will not be a moment in your career where you will not be criticized. It will happen. It will always happen. If it doesn't, then I, then maybe you're not doing something right. You might be the Jan Paulsons of the world where everyone just wants to kiss your feet just because, and that's ridiculous. And again, I'd say this to his face, so I have no problem with this being public. I, it's not a problem for me. So don't put weight on people's praise or criticism. Just focus on yourself. Be very honest when you've not met your standard say, oh, I could have done better there, and you learn from it, and you move on. It's totally okay, because you're never going to be perfect throughout your entire career. That's one. Um, two, uh, and it kind of aligns with the criticism and praise thing, just like with me, I was told, and I can tell you, if I listened to, I had a recruiter tell me once, you should really stop trying. No one is going to accept you in international arbitration. I remember where I was sitting. This was in 2007 in DC. I was teaching and they said, you just don't have the accolades for it. And I remember for about five hours, I was crushed and I was like, who is this person? If I listened to that person and the many other people who ended up being my colleagues to today and who have appointed me on arbitral panels, if I listened to them, I wouldn't be where I am today. So don't let other, if you want it bad enough, don't let people tell you not to do it. You just got to know you want it bad enough. And three, really, um, my advice, you remain sane and continue to have a long career and enjoy it is, and this is something I failed at, I can say that truly, find some balance. Um, nothing is, 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 that important and if it is then it's something like the palestine israeli issue or iraq issue or rohingya issue and then with that yeah throw your body and soul into it but find some balance in life otherwise you will resent the job i don't resent it i love it but i never found the balance so those are the three things and if you find balance you will be more successful for a longer career for sure So Thank you try ever so much. I think this has been an incredible episode for whatever us. we've discussed in this past hour or so. But I do encourage all of you to listen to the entire episode. This is this summary does not do justice to what <laughs> we're talking about. But uh, dividing this thematically, we started off discussing ISDS and how it operates today with bilateral investment treaties and the kinds of changes that we've seen. So one of the predictions Miriam makes is we might see expropriation clauses being carved out of these treaties, and, or at least the manner in which they operate change significantly. Beyond that, we have also seen several nations renegotiating how these treaties work and operate. For example, the Dutch renegotiating their non-EU BITs 2008 onwards, where you have a specific focus on environmental protection. That's a new trend, and we see that increasing worldwide. From that, we also talk about the in increasing discussions about sovereignty and questions of control that are cropping up in the ISDS sphere, with the discussion regarding the creation of a multilateral investment court with, within UN Central Working Group 3. And we have uh, diverse points of view here, where Miriam certainly disagrees with the creation of the court itself. But we also find disagreement within ourselves regarding the exhaustion of domestic remedies in municipal law before getting to the arbitration stage. But there are important discoveries to be made there, and the bringing up of counterclaims is something Miriam is very pro and supportive of, regardless of whether there is a bilateral court or not. And that is a valuable contribution to the field. From that, we move on again towards questions of what kind of a background do you need when it comes to working in this field? And of course, we have Miriam's own experiences of where she says that having a bit of focus litigating is important in the kind of skill set you are able to develop through that. But we also touch upon just how difficult it is to break into this field, wherein it's very often a closed special, a very tightly knit club, and within that sphere, we also discuss the intricacies of ISDS disputes and whether we have enough of specialization with individuals who focus on commercial arbitration, 
operating on panels. We, of course, re there is recognition that it's not so much the fact that you always have a panel of just invest commercial arbitrators, but the different perspective they can bring when we would often silo ourselves deep into a particular investment issue when they can refocus the conversation to what the dispute is really about. We also touch upon the need for diversity in the field, and we talk about arbitration, international arbitration being pale, male, and steel, and you've got a lot of tokenism operating within the sphere. But with that, there's also an important thing we flagged on, which I haven't discussed or really considered in greater detail in the past, which is age. And to allow younger practitioners, 30, 35 years with relevant experience, to be appointed to panels and, and bring the new and evolving worldview that they have, which is something that we are yet to see in most cases. From that, we also then talk about the, the way we've had things working in post-conflict or continuing conflict situations and how negotiations operate there and the kind of challenges that we see in how do you assign jurisdiction, how do you prosecute, how do you go about these? And Miriam has talked to us about the challenges in Libya, in Syria, when we're talking of non-state actors and how do you charge them? How do you try them? There are particular examples we also discuss historically, like Saddam Hussein. But from all of that, there are also important takeaways where we see how the ISDS regime differs globally. This is in defense of the fragmentation charge that the EU lays. And we can see this particularly in, say, South America, where we've been introduced to what's called a plebiscite. So you have to have a social license to operate directly from the people in the local region you plan to make your investment. That's tremendous decentralized decision and decision making that a state allows the individual people to make. I think that's a unique contribution that we see even with the expanding focus on environmental and human rights issues that, that are coming up. And we also discuss the origins of these human rights claims and the fact that they first came up as a defense and now they're evolving into full-fledged counterclaims of their own. So that's something that's really <laughs> incredible. And of course, beyond that, we've been ever so thankful to Mary for sharing her tips with what to keep in mind if you want to break into this field to be aware of yourself, want it enough, and pay no heed to either praise or criticism. With that, like we would really like to thank Miriam today for her time, for sitting together with us and making this happen. It's been a very long time putting this together and we're <laughs> very, very pleased to have you. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you, Roma. Thank you all. Thank you, Anani. You guys have been terribly patient with me and my schedule, and I am very, very honored to have come and spoken. And I hope that the listeners um, gain something. And I'm free to answer any questions, of course, too, if anyone has questions after having listened to this podcast. You guys can, of course, send them my way, Anani and Roma. I'd happily answer any. But thank you very much. Absolutely. Listeners, if you have any questions, feel free to drop in a text um, to Exterior International. We'll get you connected with Maryam. And of course, Maryam, it has been a privilege for us to speak to you today. Um, and thank you so much for all your support with ECI on the International Advisory Board and um, taking our time from your very, very busy schedule. I feel like we're, we're tired just listening to your schedule and you have to live that life. But it's, of course, very inspiring to see what you do. Um, to our listeners, this is just an inside tip. If you follow Miriam on LinkedIn, you will see another achievement. You'll see an achievement every two days, three days, Ramit. Is that true? <laughs> and uh, it, it's very inspiring to see. So I, I would suggest everyone to go follow her on LinkedIn as well. Thank, Thank you, you so much for listening to us and have a beautiful year ahead. Thank you and be safe, everybody. Thank you very much.